Ferrari thought they had endurance racing locked down. Six straight wins at Le Mans. The whole world convinced nobody could touch them. Then along comes Ford, ticked off, deep pockets, and willing to throw everything at the problem. They had Carroll Shelby in their corner, a brand new GT40, and under the hood, a 427 cubic inch sledgehammer that could change racing history. Spoiler alert, Ferrari didn't like what happened next. Howdy folks, Ed here. Welcome back to Bono's Garage. Now, if you've seen Ford v Ferrari, you know the Hollywood version of the story. Don't get me wrong, it's a great movie. But the movie plays pretty fast and loose with the facts. And while the truth is way more interesting, I'm not here today to debate about Henry the Deuce's motivations or Ken Miles getting cheated out of first place. We're here about the 427 that got him to the line and gave Ford the photo op they wanted in 1966. Because the Ford 427 wasn't just some one-off race motor. It was the peak of the FE family, the same big block line that powered Ford trucks for years before being replaced by the 429 and 460 that carried into the bullnose era. In other words, that Le Mans winning motor didn't just beat Ferrari, it laid the groundwork for Ford's big block future. Let's back up a little. Before the 427, before the GT40, and before the drama in France, Ford had to build the FE family. The FE wasn't some accident of racing. It was born as Ford's first true big block family back in 1958. FE literally stands for Ford Edsel. It, yeah, I know. The Edsel name is usually the punchline of a bad joke. But in this case, the engine family outlived the car by decades and became one of Ford's most important platforms. The FE was designed to fill the gap between the small Y-block V8s like the 292 and 312 and the heavy-duty Lincoln Mercury big blocks that were too bulky for most applications. Ford wanted one engine architecture that could scale, put it in a Thunderbird or a Galaxy and make it fast, or stick it in an F-Series truck and make it pull. That meant a middleweight big block that was compact but still capable of serious displacement. From a technical standpoint, the FE had a 4.63 inch bore spacing, which set the ceiling on displacement. That's why you'll see FEs topping out in the 428 to 430 range, while the later 385 series, 429 and 460, used a wider 4.9 inch bore spacing and had more room to grow. Deck height set at just over 10.17 inches. Cast iron blocks were the norm, and the deep skirt design gave them strength for both racing and truck duty. Didn't come cheap though. The 429 clocked in at over 600 pounds or more fully dressed. Some engineers joked it was like lifting an anvil with spark plugs. Unlike most engines where the heads are self-contained and the intake just sits on top, the FE's intake is part of the head structure itself. That made the manifolds huge and heavy, often 70 pounds or more, and swapping one isn't just a Saturday afternoon job. But that massive structure gave the top end a lot of rigidity, which was a blessing once Ford started pushing the FE into racing. Over its lifespan, the FE family covered everything from 322 cubic inches up to 428. The 352 was the first out of the gate, offered in cars and trucks in 58. By the early 60s, the 360 and 390 had become the bread and butter truck engines, torquey, reliable, and built to take abuse. These were the motors farmers, contractors, and good old boys trusted for years before the bullnoser. And that's the point I want to drive home here. The FE wasn't just a race motor. It was Ford's Swiss Army knife. Same external block, same basic design, but it could be tuned to idle smooth in a pickup, or it could be bored and stroked to scream on a NASCAR track. The 427 we're gonna focus on was the extreme end of that spectrum, the wild child of a family that also powered America's work trucks. So, why did Ford decide to build the 427? Simple, they wanted to win. In the early 60s, Ford was getting embarrassed in NASCAR. Their 390 even the 406 weren't bad engines, but not bad doesn't win at Daytona or Le Mans. NASCAR's 427 cubic inch limit was staring them in the face. Chrysler was swinging with the 426 Hemi, and Ford needed an answer. That answer was the 427. Same FE family bones, but bored and stroked right to the edge. A 4.23 inch bore and 3.78 inch stroke. That combination made a high winding 427 cubic inch big block that could hang with anything on displacement. But Ford knew size alone wasn't gonna be enough. 
So here's the problem. The FE was born as a passenger car and truck motor. It used what's called a top oiler system. Oil flows from the pump, feeds the cam and valve train first, and then makes its way down to the camshaft. And that's fine for hauling hay bales at 3000 RPM, but not for running 6500 to 7000 RPM wide open for hours. The crank was starving for oil when it needed it most, and bearings don't last long when they go dry at speed. So Ford did something radical. They created the side oiler block. This design ran a dedicated galley along the side of the block that fed the crankshaft first before anything else. The valve train could wait a fraction of a second because if the crank didn't live, nothing else mattered. It turned the FE into a reliable racing engine, one that could survive the abuse of NASCAR and the 24 hours of Le Mans. And if you know what you're looking at, side oiler blocks are easy to spot. That external oil passage is cast right into the block. Collectors today will pay a fortune for a real one because they're rare. And they solved that one weak spot that kept the FE from being a world-class race motor. Now, here's where some folks scratch their heads. If the side oiler was so good, why didn't Ford keep doing it? Well, the answer is that the side oiler was a workaround, not the future. It was a clever fix for an FE that was being pushed way beyond what it was originally designed to do. Later engines like the 429 or 460 Lima big blocks and even Windsor small blocks went back to that top oiler layout, but they had stronger main webs, bigger journals, and better oiling capacity right from the start. They didn't need the side gallery. For everyday cars and trucks, a side oiler would have just added cost, weight, and complexity, and it wouldn't have really given any benefit. So the side oiler was a one generation trick, a race bred fix that kept the FE alive at the top level but it wasn't how Ford designed engines going forward. Think of it like a pit stop on the way to Ford's later big blocks, not the destination. But, you know, call it what you want. Trick, hack, genius engineering. Bottom line is, it definitely worked. Once the 429 side oiler hit the scene, Ford wasted no time throwing it into the fight. In NASCAR, it was an instant game changer. The big bore and short stroke gave it the breathing room for high RPM. And with that side oiler system keeping the crank alive, it could run flat out all day. Four teams suddenly had the durability to hang with and beat Chrysler and GM. For a while, the 427 was the engine to have in stock car racing. And Ford didn't stop there. They got creative, maybe too creative. In 1964, they unveiled the 427 single overhead cam Cammer. This was still an FE block at heart, but with wild single overhead cam cylinder heads, timing changed so long, they looked like something off a bicycle, and the ability to spin to the moon. It was basically Ford's answer to Chrysler's 426 Hemi. NASCAR took one look and said, nope, that's too radical, and banned it before they could dominate. But on the drag strip, ah, the camera became a legend, especially in top fuel and funny cars. Guys like Connie Kalita and Don Prudhomme used it to terrorize quarter miles across the country. On paper, Ford rated it as 616 horsepower in stock trim. The NHRA, in their infinite wisdom, called it 425 for classification, which was a joke everybody was in on. In reality, tuners were pulling 700 horsepower or more, which is why those engines were absolute terrors in top fuel and funny cars. Chrysler had the Hemi, but Ford's camera was the one scaring track officials. Of course, the 427's most famous stage was across the Atlantic. Early GT40s with smaller engines had been fast, but fragile. Ferrari ran circles around the Le Mans. That changed when Carroll Shelby got involved. Shelby had already made the Cobra, a world beater by stuffing an FE into a lightweight British Roadster. So when Ford handed him the GT40 program, he knew what it needed, the 427 side oil. And here's where Ken Miles comes in. And Ken wasn't just a driver. He was Ford's secret weapon in testing. Miles would literally run engines until they grenaded, just to give Ford engineers the data they needed to make them tougher. If the 427 side oiler held together at Le Mans, it's because Ken Miles had already blown a dozen of them to pieces back in testing. He broke them so customers, or racers, didn't have to. With a big block FE sitting midship in the GT40 Mark II, everything clicked. In 1966, Ford stomped Ferrari on Le Mans with a historic one, two, three finish. That was the year of the famous photo finish where Ken Miles was robbed of the win for technical reasons. But the real story is that all three cars were Fords and all three were powered by the 427 FE. It wasn't a fluke. The GT40 kept winning four years in a row from 66 to 69, cementing Ford's place in endurance racing history. And here's a detail of the movie 
didn't really emphasize. Those 427 power GT40s were breaking 200 miles per hour on the Mulsanne straight. In 1966, that's not just fast, man. That's light years ahead of what most race cars, let alone road cars, could do at the time. Ferrari had nothing that could match that kind of straight line speed and everyone knew it. That's why the win wasn't just symbolic. Ford didn't just beat Ferrari, they flat out outran them. And for gearheads and car buffs back in the States, those GT40s weren't running exotic one-off race engines. They were running versions of the same side roller blocks you could, in theory, buy in a Galaxy, if you knew the right box to check on the order form. They were hand-built, blueprinted, and tuned to the ragged edge, but at their core, they were still FE Fords. That's part of why this story is so cool. Ford didn't just build a race motor from scratch, they weaponized a production block to take on Ferrari's best and absolutely stomped them with it. So when people talk about Chrysler's 426 Hemi as the ultimate 60s big block, Ford fans have a pretty strong rebuttal. The 426 may have owned the drag strip, but the 427 FE is the engine that took down Ferrari on the world's biggest stage. Okay, so why does all of this matter if you're standing in front of an 80s bullnose Ford? I mean, after all, no bullnose ever came with a 427 side oiler, and if we're being precise, you couldn't even get a 460 in F-150 during the bullnose years. The biggest gas engine in those trucks was a 51 Windsor. Where a 460 you had to step up to an F-250 or F-350 because that's where Ford put the heavy hitter big blocks. Here's the connection. The 427 proved something inside Ford as a company. That they could build world-class engines, and more importantly, that they had to. Before the FE, Ford was seen as solid, but conservative. Good for trucks and family cars, but not global race and glory. The 427 success changed that. It gave Ford the confidence to throw money and engineering muscle at performance, and the lessons they learned fed directly into the next generation of big blocks. Think about it this way. The FE had a 4.63 bore spacing. That's why it maxed out around 428 cubes. When Ford sat down to design the 385 series, that's the 429 and 460, they fixed that. They widened the bore spacing to 4.9 inches, gave the block more breathing room, and built in oiling improvements from the ground up. They took what the 427 side oiler taught them, that endurance requires durability at the crank, and baked it into a whole new engine family. That's the family that powered those big bullnose trucks. Now, the F-150 may not have gotten the 460, but plenty of Bono's area after 250s and 350s did. And those engines weren't just big for the sake of being big. They carried the same philosophy that the 427 proved on the racetrack. Build it big, build it tough, and make sure it can survive under serious abuse. Yeah, and there's a cultural side, too. I mean, beating Ferrari at Le Mans wasn't just a trophy for Ford. It changed how the world looked at them. Suddenly, Ford wasn't just the company that built Grandma's Galaxy or your dad's farm truck. They were the company that could stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Italians and win. That swagger carried into the muscle car era, into the Cobra Jet programs, into the Boss 429, and eventually into the trucks of the 70s and 80s. The Bonos generation wasn't designed to win Le Mans, but it inherited the same DNA of toughness and confidence that Ford had proved with the 427, this engine that we're talking about. So because this is Bono's garage, right? Here's a fun question. Would you ever stick a 427 side oiler into a Bono's? On paper, yeah, it's possible. I mean, the engine bay and those trucks is plenty big. Mounts and adapters exist, and with enough determination and cast, anything's possible. Let's be real for a second. First, cost. A genuine 427 side oiler block today is like striking oil in your backyard. Collectors, racers, and restorers all want them, and the prices are sky high. By the time you source a real block heads and taking all the hardware, you'll have more money tied up in the motor than the entire truck is worth, even if it's a nice one. Second, practicality. The FE family is heavy. That massive intake alone feels like it was cast out of a battleship armor. By comparison, the 460 is cheaper, it's easier to find, and it will make just as much or more torque for a fraction of the investment. A Windsor build, or even a stroke 408 Windsor, will give you more performance per dollar, and the parts are on every parts store shelf. Let's not kid ourselves. I mean, if you did swap a 427 into a bullnose, you'd have bragging rights for life. I mean, that's the kind of thing you pop the hood at a show and people stop mid-sentence. Most folks expect to see a 460 or a Windsor. Nobody expects to see the same engine that won Le Mans four years straight sitting in an 80s Ford pickup. I mean, that's pure why the hell not territory. And sometimes, you know, in this hobby, that's reason enough. So if you do, let me know because I want to talk to you. But would I recommend it? No, not unless you've got a winning lottery ticket or a dusty old 427 sitting in your uncle's barn, and even then, probably not. 
Here's why. Ford only built around 40,000 427 blocks in total across all the versions. Compare that to the hundreds of thousands of 390s or 428s and you see the problem. Genuine 427 side rollers are rare and collectors will pay a fortune. Drop one in a bullnose would be like using a Shelby Daytona Coupe to haul firewood. Yeah, you could do it. But most people would call you insane. But would I respect it? <laughs> you better believe it. Because a bullnose with a 427 under the hood isn't about logic, it's about making a statement. And that statement is, yeah, I put a Le Mans engine in my farm truck. What are you gonna do? The Ford 427 wasn't built to be practical. It wasn't built to idle smooth, sip gas, or make it through a 100,000 mile warranty. It was built for one reason, to win, to take the fight to Chrysler at Daytona, take it to the Ferrari at Le Mans to prove that Ford could play at the very, very top of the motorsports world, and it did. Four straight Le Mans victories, NASCAR dominance, drag racing legends. The 427 earned its place in the history of the hard way at wide open throttle. For us truck guys, it's easy to look at the 427 and say, yeah, cool story, bro. But what does that have to do with my bull nose? The answer is everything. The 427 side oiler forced Ford to innovate. It proved the value of durability, taught them how to build engines that could take punishment, and gave the company the swagger to go all in on big displacement. Without the 427 success, there's no 460. Without the 460, Bono's era trucks don't get the kind of big block glint that made them kings of towing and hauling. So no, your 80s F-150, your F-250 never came with a 427, but every single time you fire up a Bullnose, you're hearing echoes of what Ford learned in the 60s. That Le Mans winning motor didn't just beat Ferrari, it helped shape Ford big block legacy that carried all the way into the trucks that we love today. And the F-E family itself, that's a whole story of its own. The 252, the 360, the 390, engines that earned their reputation in F-Series trucks long before the Bullnose. And you know what? We'll dig into that in a future video. But for now, just remember, the Ford 427 side oiler wasn't just an engine. It was a statement. And it's a statement that still echoes through every single Ford sitting in a driveway today. And that's it, guys. That's everything that I know or pretend to know about the legendary Mama winning 427 side oiler from Ford. Any questions, comments, concerns, gripes, internet ramblings? If I got something wrong, let me know in the comments below. I really appreciate that. Again, guys, thank you so much for watching, and we will see you next time. She's rough around the edges, but she's doing fine. Tinkering away, getting things to shine. That old nose garage, she's considered divine. Thanks again for.